Jim Merton Schramm, and I'm a professor at Luther College. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I assume you were all there yesterday when I gave my talk, and one, one of my former students came up. He said, "He said, wow, you're such a good professor in the classroom, but I was really depressed yesterday." <laughs> I said, "You know, I was kind of depressed too." <laughs> so I feel bad about that. I certainly wasn't trying to. Be depressing, but it is it is depressing information, and you know at the end of the day we do need to face this stuff. We can't just ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist, and we have to we have to at least hear it, comprehend it, and then figure out what it means and, and what what to do about it. So my focus this morning is going to be a lot tamer. Uh, it should be a lot less depressing. Uh, why why Lutherans care for creation. Um, and let me just begin, I'll, I'll say, whoops, what's going on here? Oh, okay, I did something wrong. Sorry. My colleague in computer science is convinced that I'm plagued by gremlins, by technological gremlins. Okay, what's it doing? These are the first couple slides are just the uh, uh, same ones I had from yesterday. But, uh, anybody from Luther College? Anybody went to Luther College? Raise your hands. Anybody with kids at Luther College? Raise your hands. Anybody with grandchildren that have gone to Luther College? Warburg, sorry. Warburg. Uh, hey, well, th th this is what I said in, in the other other section. I mean, just think about you know we're. We're not a very big church. What are we? 3.7 million people, but we got 24, I think, it's 24 colleges and universities, and they're all pretty darn good. And what a great, what a great gift to the world and to our children to give them this kind of range of opportunity. So our young, our oldest son went to Luther. Our youngest son went to Saint Olaf. I grew up in Moline, Illinois, and, and visited Augustana. It was just a little too close to home, but it's a great place. Um, anyway, we're just lucky to have all of these fabulous uh, colleges. So to the extent that you can support them, I hope you will. Um, how many of you have been to one of our um, um, outdoor ministry centers or, or Bible camps? You mean anywhere? Anywhere, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, I mention it or raise it up now because that's another incredible gift that our church has. And it's directly related to this focus on why, why Lutherans care, care for creation. I, I, I teach, you know, I have the privilege of teaching so many wonderful young people that, that come to Luther. And many of them, I have them write ecological autobiographies and ethical autobiographies, you know, where do your values come from. And for a lot of them, you know, it's these experiences in these church camps and in your congregations that are deeply formative. And so realize that and just understand what an important role our church camps have in terms of fostering this care for creation in, in young people. Um, Luther is a beautiful place. Uh, uh, have any of you been to Decora? Okay. Anybody been there recently? Okay. You have it, come back right now, in fact. Just you know, blow off the rest of the afternoon. And it's just gorgeous. I mean, it's spring, it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, we, we do have that big old turban on the hill now, and for many that's a source of beauty. For, for some, it, I know it's a sort of an eyesore, uh, but it's, it does produce a lot of power for, for Luther and for, for Decorah. Um, this theme, Why Lutherans Care for Creation, is, is rooted in the college's mission. Um, I showed you last night, we we're trying to reduce our carbon footprint and we're basically halfway there. Um, you know, last night I talked about what's wrong. Um, today I'm going to talk about why we should care. But what I really spend most of my time doing is how to make it better. And so I've been a, played a big role at Luther in terms of our various energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. I'm really heavily involved in that work in the state of Iowa. So if you'd rather talk about nuts and bolts like that, I can talk until the cows come home. Uh, 
But today, I'm in, in this session, I'm just going to focus on this stuff. I'm going to try to explain to you why we as Lutherans, why care for creation is deeply rooted in our religious tradition. And then at the end, uh, I'll offer some brief resources for faithful response and uh, hopefully have at least 20 minutes for questions and conversation. And you can just stop me at any point uh, going through. But the, the first place I want to begin is with Martin Luther. Um, he's an incredibly important figure in terms of the Lutheran tradition, obviously, but he was really the hinge between the medieval world and the modern world. Uh, his father uh, was a, uh, an early, uh, he owned some mine, <coughs> mines and smelters. So Luther would have seen significant, uh, you know, kind of invasive activity of human beings on the planet. But what is very clear from reading his works is that Martin Luther had a deep and abiding appreciation for creation and a sense for how God was pervading all of creation. So I want to just run through a series of slides now um, that are mostly just visual images and, and uh, placed on top of those images are brief quotes from Luther's works that demonstrate this claim of mine that uh, Martin Luther had this deep and abiding uh, appreciation of, of, of God's presence in all of creation. Some of these slides come from my colleague uh, Kim uh, Winchell, who's diaconal minister for earthkeeping. And I always get this, I have to always look at this, in the ELCA's Northwest Lower Michigan Synod. So here's the first one. The power of God is present at all places, even in the tiniest tree leaf. Do you think God is sleeping on a pillow in heaven? God is wholly present in all creation, in every corner, behind you, and before you. Everything that lives has life of him, and through him, and in him. God is entirely and personally present in the wilderness, in the garden, in the field. How many of you are gardeners? God is eternally and personally present in the wilderness in the garden, in the field. Have any of you been to Holden Village in Washington State? Okay. Uh, for me, when I hear wilderness, that's what I associate with it. I've, I've spent a fair bit of time there. If you have a chance, I would add it to your bucket list. Go to Holden Village. You'll understand when you get there. <laughs> if you haven't been there. Luther, Luther says, the face of God shines forth in all his creatures. I chose this slide because part of my youth was spent uh, living in South Africa. And I just love this image of, uh, of uh, zebras on the felt. Luther says, God's entire divine nature is wholly and entirely in all creatures. More deeply, more inwardly, more present than the creature is to itself. This one's so great given the season we're in right now. The birds sing sweetly in the branches and praise God with all their power, night and day. Uh, now that it's a little warmer and we turn the open the windows, you know, and don't worry about pushing all that heat out of the house. Uh, this is how we wake up in the morning in the Korah, as the birds are chirping away. And it's fun to think of them praising God with all their power, night and day. Luther says, God is in all creatures, even in the smallest flowers, even mice. Luther says, the mouse is a divine creature, beautiful in form, with such pretty feet and such delicate hair. Now, last year when I gave this workshop, there was a pastor who uh, said, yeah, and this was, he waited until we got to the end, and he said, yeah, okay, that was very, very cute about, about the mouse, but you ought to put up a picture of a rat, and how rats spread bubonic plague, and about all the parts of nature that are trying to kill us all the time. And he's right. 
He's right. It is true. And some of you know what this means. Some of you may be living with illnesses um, and you're battling the forces of nature that are... We're all going to die, but some of us are going to die sooner. Uh, and so, true. Absolutely true. And we, we are members of a religious tradition, the Lutheran tradition, that understands that it's not necessarily either or. It's both and. <clears throat> but what I'm trying to show you is that there is within our founder, or progenitor, Martin Luther, and in our tradition, this deep and abiding understanding that God pervades all of reality, all of creation, and that is good. And frankly, mortality is good too, because from our death comes the life of other creatures. Not so good for us, but it's how God has constructed life in the, in the universe. So that's just a little aside. Uh, this is my last slide um, on this theme. Uh, Luther says, God wants to be praised for nourishing and cherishing, for God cherishes all creatures. God is not only the creator, but is also the sustainer and nourisher. I'm teaching a course at Luther right now called Eco-Reformation, and within it we are uh, reading um, Pope Francis's encyclical, Laudato Si. And in it, uh, in fact it was just a reading for this last uh, Tuesday, he encourages Christians in general, and Catholics in particular, to recover the practice of saying grace before and after every meal. At home, um, Karen and I, uh, we go through different kinds of table graces, but one that we, is, that we often recite together is this. The eyes of all wait upon you, O Lord. You give us our food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. God the sustainer, God the nourisher, not just of us, but of all of God's creatures. Um, in addition to Martin Luther's sympathies, I want to talk a little bit about our confessional heritage and how creation care is rooted within those within those aspects of our tradition. So just some brief comments derived from the three ecumenical creeds. The first article, the second, and the third. God is the creator of all that exists. The universe, the cosmos. Just for a moment, take your knuckle and wrap your, wrap your skull or tap your knee. Come on. So what's, what's that hard stuff that you were just tapping? Huh? Bone. Where did the bone come from? Where the bone yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stars. You are stardust. The carbon in your body comes from the universe. You are a part of the universe. God created all that exists. The second article of the Creed talks about the word become flesh. It's this incarnation. Jesus Christ is God incarnate. Our tradition says that the divine became an animal, became a mammal, became a human being like you and me. That God, the creator of all that exists, became like us. This incarnational theology should confer dignity on all that God has made. Should help us understand God's affirmation of the material world, the physical world, the living world, and even the abiotic aspects of the world. The third article is the Holy Spirit. Um, you won't find this in, in any of the creeds, uh, but I like this term. Earth is the habitat of the Holy Spirit. Uh, one of my colleagues in Christian ethics, James Nash, coined this term. He's a Methodist theologian and a really great uh, Christian ethicist. Um, we desperately need new ways of thinking. We need to think creatively about the problems we face as human beings living together 
as human beings living on this planet. And I am grateful for the fact that the Holy Spirit dwells among us, inspires us, continues to breathe new life, new creativity into us. Another emphasis in uh, the creeds is this notion of redemption. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The world, not just for God so loved us as human beings, but for God so loved the world. Uh, and so this understanding of the, of the relationship between redemption and the restoration of creation is really important. One of the gentlemen sitting in the back row over there at the end brought up uh, restoration of, of creation and uh, wanted us to talk about the fact that there are a lot of people that are trying to clean up the planet, so to speak, who aren't necessarily Christians, but in his work are doing the work of redemption, in his mind are doing the work of redemption. I would say you bet they are. And all I'm trying to get across here is that redemption isn't just a personal thing for us as human beings about our eternal home, but rather involves caring for creation in, in, in all respects. Soon we'll celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation in 2017. Here's Martin Luther, here I stand, I can go no farther. There are some folks in the Lutheran community here in the United States and around the world who are saying, absolutely, let's celebrate the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. But friends, we have got to look forward, not just backwards. And so some of my colleagues are talking about the need for an eco-reformation, that we need to stand up and urge the church to reform the ways we're living on this planet. Because if we don't change the ways we're living on this planet, I'm not sure, personally, I'm not sure there will be enough of us around to remember the Protestant Reformation of five hundred years. And that's kind of where I was talking last night, and it gets pretty bleak pretty fast. Um, so, let's go back to the positive. <laughs> um, in the Augsburg Confession, we have these words, uh, We cannot be justified before God by our own strength, merit, or works but we are freely justified for Christ's sake through faith. It is not our job to save the planet and thus to save ourselves. Our justification is a free gift of God through no work of our own, and it sweeps over us like an unstoppable wave. So when Amos says, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, let justice roll down like waters, that's what he's talking about. This huge wave, or flood, that pushes everything out of the way. This is what our tradition means when we talk about justification by grace through faith. It is this sweeping love of God that sweeps all of our incapacity, all of our inability, all of our moral failings away, and sweeps us along with God's grace into the world. And so the, the rest of this line is, this faith is bound to bring forth good fruits. It is necessary to do good works commanded by God because of God's will. Not because we're going to be saved by our good works. Not because we're going to save the planet. But rather it's because we are freed by grace to make our faith active in Love. And one aspect of that, aspect of love, is to engage in lawful civil ordinance. The Augsburg Confession reads, Lawful civil ordinances are good works of God. It is right for Christians to bear civil office, to sit as judges, to judge matters by the imperial and other existing laws. Are any of you involved in local government, or are any judges, or it's unusual, but I'm just going to ask. Because if so, I was going to say good for you. Um, are any of you, now, you know, don't get me wrong here, I'm not, not sticking a finger in the eye of any particular political party, but are any of you kind of frustrated with the quality of leaders that we see in politics today? <laughs> I mean, it wasn't even done with my sons. <laughs> All right. Okay, so now I'm going to say something. And you may not like it. So if you're frustrated with the quality of people you see running for political office, then I encourage you to think about
about running for political office. Mm -hmm. You may be the change you're waiting to see. And why, how do we get onto this? How are we talking about this? I thought this was about care for creation. Well, I'm telling you, you're Lutherans. And Lutherans believe God is at work in the world, in the church, but also <coughs> in the institutions of the state. That's what I just read to you. That God is at work in those world, in those world. Politics is not some God-forsaken enterprise. But God is at work there. And you may actually get more done over there sometimes than you can in the church. At least that's been my experience. Uh, so I'm being really serious about this when I say this. Um, you know, we're all really fortunate to live in a democracy. And I know there's some people, and there was one sip over there that wasn't so sure we did. She's pretty sure we live in, a, in a, either an a oligarchy or a plutocracy. Or a cactusocracy. A what? A cactus stock Cactus, not one. Government by the evilest people in the society. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> not, not yet. Good. Good. And his tongue was sort of in his cheek. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Right. Sorry. Who no, knows? no, that's fine. Anyway, but you, you get my point, right? Is, is that part of our tradition is saying that we can be good stewards of creation by being engaged politically. That certainly as a citizen, but also as an elected official, or as a volunteer to serve on your planning and zoning board, and board of commission, and your soil and water conservation district. That's the work of God, I'm telling you. <laughs> so, uh, okay, we're move on. Uh, Luther's large catechism. Uh, Luther says, and this is a great slide, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? This is what I mean and believe, that I am a creature of God. That is, that he has given and constantly preserves to me my body, soul, and life, members great and small, all my senses, reason, and understanding, and so on. So this is Jane Goodall, uh, famous for her work with uh, chimpanzees and other animals. And uh, I like to think that they are both here praising God, uh, perhaps in different voices. Um, but uh, it's a beautiful picture. Uh, this line goes on. Uh, Luther goes on to reflect. He says, besides, he causes all creatures to serve for the uses and necessities of life, sun, moon, and stars, and the firmament, day and night, air, fire, water, earth, and whatever it bears and produces, birds and fishes, beasts, grain and all kinds of produce and whatever else there is of bodily and temporal goods, good government, peace and security. It's a good German. I always write a really long sentence. At least here it's not negated at the end. Uh, he causes all creatures to serve for the uses and necessities of life. So here we got a couple of bear cubs grabbing lunch. And in the lunch are salmon who have come back to the, the, the if they could, to the to the uh, creek bed where they where they were packed, where, where, where they were spawned. And obviously, I, I'm going to hope that these bears got these salmon after they spawned their eggs, uh, and so the eggs are hopefully in, in the creek bed. But regardless, this is how God has created the world, and that predation um, is part of life. Part of life is death, uh, and so causes all creatures to serve for the uses and necessities of life. My mother is buried in a mausoleum in Moline, and she's about there in the mausoleum. And there's the ground. And I, you know, they bought the spots before they died. So we were sitting at dinner one night, and I said, well, why are you getting buried in some mausoleums eight feet off the ground? She said, I don't want those bugs to get me. <laughs> I said, Mom, they're going to get you. <laughs> she said, no, they're not. <laughs> yeah, they are. Just give them enough time. They're going to get you. And it causes all creatures to serve for the uses and necessities of life. Sometimes when I get really depressed, and it's easy to get, you know, you saw the kind of stuff I was talking about yesterday. It's, it's bleak. And it is easy to get depressed. And like I said, it's a temptation. We need to resist it. But sometimes I do think, 
but the most good I'm going to do for the world is when my kids put me in the ground and other critters get to eat off of me. And that's what Pastor Jacobson, our former pastor at First Lutheran, said when I gave this talk there last Sunday. He said, he said, you know, those salmon, um, when they die, uh, they decay in the water, and the fingerlings eat the flesh, eat, you know, get sustenance from their parents. It's kind of icky, but it is how life works. And we need to we need to recover this ecological dimension to life to fully affirm creation and the value of, of all that exists. If nothing else from this presentation, you get to look at pretty slides. <laughs> Luther says, uh, "Thus we learn from this article that none of us has of himself, or nor nor can preserve his life, nor anything that is here enumerated." or can be enumerated, however small and unimportant a thing it might be, for all is comprehended in the word creator. So just a few additional emphases, Lutheran emphases in creation care. One is this notion of the finite bearing the infinite. Here, in a manger, in a stable, surrounded by animals, is an infant. In, infant. And in this infant, the finite bears the infinite. As I said before, this deeply incarnational theology that God takes human form, becomes an animal, and dwells with us. Uh, this understanding can help us confer dignity and value to all living things. Another really important part of our tradition is the theology of the cross. That God is with those who suffer. God understands suffering because suffering has been central to the life of God and the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. This theology of the cross enables us to not avoid suffering, not to deny suffering, to understand that God is with us in our suffering, and more importantly, or as importantly, to accompany others in their suffering. The theology of the cross enables us not to flee from it, but to face it, and to work through it, and to understand that God is with us through that suffering. Not everybody talks that way. Not everybody thinks that way. And what I want to get across here is that it isn't just our suffering as human beings. God cares about the welfare of all that God has made. You now, polar bears are kind of the iconic species in that regard as we think about global warming and what it's doing to their habitat. But, and I'm pretty sure you know this, right? We're living through this planet's sixth largest extinction event. Species are vanishing on our, on our planet at a, at a pace that they've never vanished before. And in the past, it was because some you know, volcano blew up or some meteor struck the Earth. But now it's really not that. It's because of the collective impact of our lives on theirs. Part of our tradition is calling us to understand their suffering and to try to act in solidarity to help them. Related to help is this emphasis on God at work in the world through disaster response. One of the problems with climate change is that we are seeing an increasing frequency and intensity in natural disasters. And based on what I read, it looks like that's only going to get worse. And so, you know, they've got a stewardship workshop next door. I don't know if any of you are in that workshop, but before this one, well, the first one wasn't very well attended. And I heard somebody walk in and say, yeah, who wants to give money? Well, what I'm telling you is there's going to be a lot of hurt coming down the road. And we're going to have to dig deep in our pockets. And others are going to dig deep in their pockets to help you. Because my guess is you, too, will be affected by one of these. I was in 2008. We were evicted from our homes or evacuated. So anyway, uh, 
one, uh, a few more slides on these points. Uh, we can't really find where Martin Luther says this. Uh, it's, it's kind of apocryphal, but it's a great line, and so it keeps getting repeated. You know, so Luther asked, what, "What would you do if you heard the, if you knew the world was going to end tomorrow?" And he said, "I'd go out and plant my apple tree." And that's what I mean by hope being a choice. You choose to hope. It's easy to fall over into the pit of despair. But you choose to hope, and you choose to act. Do we have anything unique to bring uh, to creation care? Uh, I think a lot of what I've said is not necessarily unique, but is pretty important. And I don't know as if these are unique <coughs> Lutheran perspectives, but I think I have three or four here that I want to just try out in front of you. We live in a, in a period of time where we sort of have a rampant anthropocentrism. This notion that we as human beings are the most important thing on the planet. That we are the measure and the measurer of value. You know, our lives are utterly dependent upon the welfare and health of ecological, of, 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 of ecosystems. If other species aren't doing well, we're not going to do well because we're more or less at the top of that food chain. And if everything below is suffering, we're in bad shape. So for me, we have got to figure out how to get rid of this anthropocentrism. And from my perspective, it's the theocentrism that is central to the Christian worldview that is a good antidote. That at the end of the day, we are not the ones that decide who and what has value. That's God's job. God's the creator of the world. God is the creator of all that exists. So if we can recover that theocentric perspective, that might put us in our place a little bit better. Another is the rampant individualism that we live in in our society. It really is, in my view, rampant. Um, and I don't want to, don't mishear me, you know. God knows, according to the scriptures, how many hairs are on each of your heads. God values each and every one of you as individual creatures. But that's not the primary way we talk about our identity in the Christian tradition. We are members of the body of Christ. Wherever two or three are gathered, there I am with you. It isn't just about who we are individually, it's how we individually work together for the welfare of others. So our emphasis, I know it doesn't seem like your congregations are particularly revolutionary or countercultural, but they are. Look around. How many people take the time to get together on a weekly basis with other with more with other groups of people to dedicate themselves to the care and redemption of all that God has made. There aren't many people. And so your little congregations are living a countercultural lifestyle and challenging the rampant individualism of our culture. Another thing I want to lift up to you is uh, that our accountability to God leads us to care about the welfare of present and future generations. Um, what would you say is the most powerful lobby in Congress today? Oil. Oil lobbies. Drug companies. Drug companies, okay, yeah. Boy, and that's something you watch the television news and it's like every commercial is one big drug <coughs> after another. What did you say? Banking. Banking. NRA. NRA, okay, National Rifle Association. Others? <coughs> Insurance companies. Okay, so we can, we can think about lots of really powerful lobbies in Congress. Now, what's the name of the lobby that's the best spokesperson for future generations? Education. education, National Education Association. Now, friends, this group but not all at once. Great for the world. Okay, good for you. There aren't a whole lot of examples coming off your tongues. I would say uh, AARP. <coughs> what is that? Is it American Association or Association for the Advancement of Retired Persons? And I think they are because they care about grandchildren. But my point, right, is that it's hard for us to put our finger 
National Education Association came out pretty fast, so that's, that's great, and it came up in the other one. But in general, it's hard for us to think about who actually is representing the interests of future generations. Well, I guess I would say to you, as Christians, if we're not advocates for future generations, who is going to be? We have an obligation to seek their welfare. Martin Heilbrunner, an economist, wrote a famous essay called What Has Posterity Ever Done For Me? What have people in the future ever done for you? Nothing. They can't. That's the point. Is that we have to do something for them even though it's unreciprocated. What do we call that in Christianity? That's called agapeic love. Self-sacrificial love. You do something that can't be reciprocated. Ecological justice is simply the idea that justice pertains not only to the relationships between human beings and the homo sapiens species, but that we have obligations to other species, that it is unjust for them to be treated in certain ways, whether to be produced for food for us to eat, or whether it be through our neglect or sometimes ignorance, but nevertheless uh, overfishing, overhunting that leads to their demise. But ecological justice is key. Uh, two final quotes. Uh, I like this one from Bonhoeffer's <coughs> yesterday. Bonhoeffer's my favorite theologian. He says, The earth that nourishes me has a right to my work and my strength. It is not fitting that I should despise the earth on which I have my life. I owe her faithfulness and gratitude and must not dream away my earthly life with thoughts of heaven. Uh, one of the pastors that was in the previous hour talked about some Christian evangelicals that are in his community and how, from his perspective, all of what I've been talking about isn't really relevant because they keep talking about heaven as, as their eternal home. They're just poor, wayfaring strangers wandering through this world of, of woe. Um, and if God could create the world in six days, God can fix it in, in six days. Uh, their focus is, is on heaven. And... I don't agree with that. And what I'm trying to show you is that one of the best Lutheran theologians we've ever had didn't agree with that. And if that ain't good enough, well then let's look at the book of Revelation. Uh, let the Bible teach us. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud, loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. David Rhodes tells me, told, uh, recounts this story in this uh, article or essay in this book that I'm co-editing, that he's often told his students, you know, if you're so focused on heaven, you better uh, pay attention because you may pass Jesus on the way to earth. Uh, if your focus is always going there, you may need to realize God is, is coming here. Um, all right, I'm going, I'm going to just wrap up here, just run through some quick slides. These are some handouts uh, uh, of uh, resources for creation care that I think are really helpful. So I'll pass these around and uh, take whatever you want. And then these are some uh, pieces from Tammy Walhoff from Lutheran Advocacy, Minnesota. Uh, looks like I uh, there aren't too many left here, but you want me to pass this around, so we'll take a think what you like from that. Uh, so just quickly, this uh, Lutheran's Restoring Creation.org, uh, David Rhodes is, was the sort of progenitor of this. It's a great, great resource. Uh, it's, a, it's not a particularly short uh, web link. Um, but uh, once you get there, I'm sure your computer will, will remember it has a whole bunch of resources for all of those uh, groups, uh, including church camps and, uh, and con congregations. Um, I don't know, have any of you uh, had a study in your congregation of the ELCA social statement on caring for creation? Uh, it's old now. I mean, 1993, it'll be 25 years in 2018. Um, I encourage you to go read it. If it was on the table of the Lutheran advocacy folks out here, um, 
it reads, when I read it, it reads like it was written yesterday. Um, and so it really is an excellent resource. It's, it's a good place for a congregation to, you know, for an adult forum group to, to chew on something. So take a look at that, and blow the dust off it, and talk about it again. I don't know if you're familiar with Interfaith Power and Light. Have you heard of that organization? Um, I'm the chair of the Iowa chapter of Interfaith Power and Light. Interfaith insofar as it's trying to bring people of faith from all sorts of religious traditions together who care about climate change. And so that's been the primary focus of Interfaith Power and Light. But you have a good active chapter here in, in Minnesota. They have lots of good resources. Uh, the national organization has great resources. So you have the web links to all of those on the back page of the one I gave you. Green Faith is very similar, do very similar interfaith work on, um, on, on the environment. And then this is the National Council of Churches Creation Justice Ministries. And finally, down the road, Luther College. We have a Center for Sustainable Communities. Um, I'm not sure we have a, a, a lot of resources that are tailored to congregations, but uh, we have a lot of interest in, in promoting sustainability in all of the communities here in our little part of the upper mid Midwest. And so, you know, if there's any way we can be helpful to you in your congregations, in, in your communities, please let us know. We just finished a, a round of uh, workshops on solar, <coughs> promoting solar for homes and businesses and farms in six counties around Winnesha County. And we'd be happy to, to run those up in your community as, as well. Uh, although I'm sure you have lots of good folks in your community promoting renewable energy as, as well. So I'll stop there. 40 minutes it says according to my clock here uh, on, on this presentation. And what what kinds of reactions or questions or thoughts do, do my remarks uh, elicit from you? Uh, we did a, had a presentation recently on climate, the science of climate change. It was yeah. wonderful, wonderful presenter. Uh, and uh, somebody who just heard we were going to have that, and of course who didn't come to the presentation, so this isn't the church's business. And it seems to me that without even laying that question aside, is it man-made climate change? It's certainly the church's business. The issue of, just the general issue of caring for creation, that's just an editorial comment. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. And you know, and that's that's the problem, right? People, it, it, it can be controversial, or, or we can agree that climate change is happening, but we won't necessarily agree about why. Or we might agree about why, but we can't agree about what to do about it. But we still have this charge in the tradition yeah. of our faith and our, our scripture. Yeah, welcome to life and community. That's <laughs> what it is. You know, we get together and we may not all agree, but we're in good faith trying to solve something. But I totally agree with you that it's inappropriate to say that the church should have nothing to do with climate change. That's ridiculous. If, you, if, you, if I haven't persuaded you that God cares about creation, now, I guess I'm not going to be able to. There were hands in the back there. Yep. Uh, I, when you struck the, the slide, the ego and the ego, uh -huh. I was intrigued because in reading Chinese poetry, they really do not use the first person pronoun. Yeah. If you were to say, as we say, I hear a church bell ringing, they would say, a church bell is ringing. Behind that is, there's a gopher in the field, there's a rabbit in the field, there's, there's a, <laughs> creatures out there that hear that same bell. And it's just not our ego trip that only we hear. Yeah. I've always been fascinated. Yeah, no, I, yeah, great, great example. And, you know, we just sort of take it for granted that, of course, we're going to look at the world through this narrow, individualistic lens. But it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. Yeah. To hear it. To hear it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's a rampant anthropocentrism. It's only our ears that seem seem to matter.
Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, let, let me let me just talk a little bit about that. So Luther College has, you know, we're a big campus. I think it's 1.4 million condition you know, square feet of condition space. Um, our big uh, center for the arts is a geothermal facility, and before that, we built a residential facility called Baker Village that is geothermal. And so that was built in the late 90s, and uh, it's a separate part of our campus. It houses about 112 students, and when the college, we were growing at the time, and so when the administration said, okay, we're, we're going to do this, the students kind of pushed back and they said, you know, geez, can't you go up? Why do you have to go out? And, the, and you know, there were good answers, reasons why that was the case. And so then the students said, well, if you're going to do this, then at least be as efficient as you can. And we think the, the more efficient way to do it is to tap into geothermal energy. And so our vice president for finance and administration agreed to meet with the students. They met a couple times and she was <coughs> persuaded. She actually, her, her prior job before coming to Luther was in the construction industry. So she, she knew a little bit about geothermal. So in the RFP for Baker Village that we sent out to construction companies, Geothermal was in there. And so uh, they came back and presented their, their proposals, and Geothermal wasn't included in what they proposed. And, and so then the VP reported that to the students and, and, and what the companies had said. And what the companies had said was, you, you could do that at a, at a home scale, but you know we're talking about big buildings here. You really can't do it at that scale. And so the VP told the student group that, the students said, well, we're pretty sure you can. And then they started, you know, the students, this is what they do, they research things. They put out these examples in front of her, and she's like, you know, she could read. And so she brings back bitters, and she said, I don't think you understood what we asked for. It says right here in the RFP that we want geothermal integrated into the building design. And they said, yeah, but you can't do it. She said, well, I'm pretty sure you can. And so if you want our business, You'll be back here in two weeks. And if you don't, well, I guess it's been nice seeing you. They were back in two weeks. And we have geothermal. Why? Because some students pushed for it. Now, that said, um, that space on our campus costs us 40% less to heat and cool. Now, part of that is it's more modern construction than buildings built in 1960. Godforsaken buildings in some respects. But anyway, uh, that, that area of our campus is not connected to our central steam heat, heating plant. So the only energy that is used at Baker Village is geothermal energy, so we, we capture